Thank you for joining us um, for today's feature presentation, the Maricopa Pollinator Pathway, how you can support pollinators in your outdoor living space, uh, presented by Danielle Carlock. Um, Danielle has been gardening in the desert for about 10 years. She founded the Maricopa Native Seed Library in 2020 as a way to distribute free seed to the community and to promote the use of native plants in the landscape with a special emphasis on supporting pollinators. She just recently launched the Maricopa Pollinator Pathway Initiative that certifies pollinator habitat in the Phoenix metro area and helps build interconnected pollinator habitat. She has taught biology at the high school and college level and is currently a library faculty member at Scottsdale Community College. And we're also proud to say that she is the uh, Phoenix chapter of the Arizona Native Plant Society's treasurer. Um, so thank you, Danielle, for um, being our presenter this evening. We look forward to learning about the Maricopa Pollinator Pathway. Thank you so much, Lisa. Before we get started, I wanted to dedicate this presentation to Pam McMillie, who recently passed away. She was our vice president of the Phoenix chapter. Um, she had, was becoming a good friend of mine. I was just getting to know her in the last year or two. And um, not only did she help create the guidelines for the pathway as part of the panel that, that was working with me, but she also was growing out plants for the pathway and also came to some of our gardening, um, our events to uh, plant some of the gardens that we were working on. So she's really um, embedded in this project, even though she's not with us here right now. So I've really, um, this presentation is really geared to an audience that I'm, I make no assumptions about what people may know or may be doing about native plants and gardening because I never know the audience. Um, in this particular audience, it looks like there's quite a few people who are already into native plant gardening and know a lot about that. But I just want to kind of back up and say, you know, I'm just kind of from that more general perspective because I just don't know where people are coming from. Um, in their practices and, and things like that. So I'll be talking about um, this Maricopa Pollinator Pathway Project. And kind of my hook is to say, like, if you're concerned about this long laundry list of sort of, you know, environmental crises that we're facing as a planet, um, and the list is there, um, this is something you could consider as, as something that I think you can do um, creating habitat at home essentially is what this is. I think that is it is really one of the most impactful ways a person or family can contribute and make a difference, you know, collectively as we all kind of get on board with these things toward these all these issues that we're facing. So that's kind of um, that's where I'm at, especially with having been doing like habitat at home now for about a decade. I really feel like it's one of the ways that I can really make an impact. Um, on these things we're facing. And I think collectively we can as well. So the Maricopa Pollinator Pathway, it's a free certification program and it's meant to kind of equip people no matter whether they're at home or where they work, um, at their schools, uh, different businesses, parks, things like that to develop pollinator habitat. And it's really um, the, the um, Sort of the objective is to really get anybody and everybody involved. There's no size requirements. You don't have to be a large landowner to contribute, even um, an apartment and a balcony. And there's a way to contribute to habitat at home and, and uh, pollinator habitat. So the guidelines that we'll talk about, they were developed for Maricopa County, but they do apply to other counties that are adjacent to us under 3,000 feet. So Gila or Pinal or, um, you know, I, I think Yavapai, um, Yuma County, all of our adjacent counties that are essentially um, Sonoran Desert, um, it does apply to those as well. And the plant list we put together applies to those as well. Um, so really how it works is, and tonight we'll talk about the guidelines. So learning about the guidelines, maybe a lot of you are already doing these things already. Um, if not, if not, uh, implement them. And then you can sign up for the free program on our website and get on the map. We have a growing map of um, habitats around the valley. And there is signage uh, kind of in production. That first um, slide, it had a picture of what the sign looks like. 
Um, so that's sort of it in a real nutshell, but I wanna go into like some of the whys in a little more depth, um, just because I wanna, I think that background is really important to set up, especially if people aren't familiar with some of these concepts. So first, I've already mentioned this habitat at home idea, and I think that's really the central concept of what this program's about. And there are other habitat at home programs as well that are around um, regionally and around the country and beyond. And so the idea here is that, and I think a lot of thinkers, you know, people have really, I think this is becoming more, um, I don't know, kind of more of a realization about this. And that idea is that there are so many threats to our wildlands, you know, whether it's wildfire, we have development, urbanization, we have drought, invasive species, and then we have climate change as a threat multiplier of all those threats, really. Um, I think this realization that we need to do more where we live. Um, I think Doug Tallamy has really become a kind of a really the big, big spokesperson for the, these ideas. And he has some books uh, that he's published about this. He speaks about this a lot and a website too, Homegrown National Park. And I think that's actually the name of the website or maybe the main theme of it. And what, what really is, I think the, the bottom line is we're saying, you know, that we need to do more where we live because there's just too many threats to our wildlands. They're too, they've got, they've shrunken, they're fragmented and they're under a lot of threats. And so the more that we can do where we live, um, the better, um, the better for the planet just overall. So really habitat at home is sort of a, a really a more expansive approach to gardening. You know, over all these centuries, you know, humans have been involved in a lot of gardening for aesthetic, you know, aesthetics to have the garden that looks, that looks perfectly cultivated. And it has, you know, all these plants, maybe not even native, but are, you know, to, to um, you know, the old English gardens and all these different gardens that people are trying to replicate all around the world and this aesthetic idea. But really, it's more about, you know, how do we support the wildlife around us and make gardening about that? So it's really gardening intentionally with native plants and other wildlife friendly practices. And this can be small. It doesn't have to be a large space. And I'm going to talk more about how it can be good for you and your family, community and wildlife as well. And so that's sort of what this slide is about. Um, I've kind of been thinking, you know, how, what are all the ways that you can make arguments for the use of native plants and habitat at home to kind of reach lots of different audiences, you know, and I think these five points are things to ponder. Some may resonate with one person more than others, um, really just depends on people's worldview, where they're coming from, their life experience, but these five points, um, as far as ecological, and we'll be talking about this a lot, um, Native plants, lots of studies show that native plants benefit wildlife, native wildlife more than non-natives. Not to say that non-natives can't provide some benefits, but there are these long-standing ecological, these relationship, these food, food webs, these interconnections, um, coevolution between many of the insects and plants and so on and so forth, that really having native plants in a landscape is much more beneficial even if you're not talking about, you know, not being out on a national forest or a national park, but even in habitat at home, um, there's ecological benefits to, to having these kind of spaces. Um, then there's economic arguments too. So as you do more gardening with native plants, you're reducing your need for water, which is gonna lower your water bill, reducing your need for maintenance, um, and also, um, costs related to using various chemicals because our native plants really don't require those kind of inputs. So there's kind of an economic argument there. And you could even go further and say, you know, a place in a lot of places and Arizona is no exception, tourism is important for us. And one of the reasons people come here is they want to see what's unique and special about the Sonoran Desert. And so by us maintaining landscapes that, that limit invasives and that promote natives, we're really just kind of developing that more, that approach, you know, uh, just more widely across the valley. And then as far as health benefits, a couple of different arguments there. Um, plants have been shown to have medicinal value. Um, the, all around the world, there's many different, you know, plants that are used medicinally. We want to continue to conserve those plants because we haven't fully ex explored all the medicinal uses. And many of our Sonoran Desert plants have medicinal uses. Um, so that's one argument. Also, there's a health argument about when you're out 
in nature, whether that's, you know, full blown out on the Tonto hiking around or in the nature, the, the sort of the replica that you have in your backyard or something like that, your kind of approximation, um, being out in that kind of um, environment, it's good for your health, it lowers blood pressure, and it, it increases um, well-being, you know, mood, things like that. So there's definitely health benefits to gardening and being out in nature that you can enjoy by having habitat at home. And then um, in addition, by reducing your use of chemicals in the environment through landscaping with native plants, you're also putting less toxins into the environment. And I think there's moral and spiritual considerations too. If you think about the intrinsic value of these plants and of our wildlife, that they have, uh, they exist, they have um, intrinsic value beyond any, any benefit they may provide. They have value in and of themselves. And so they should be conserved. And then um, if you look at spiritual traditions, you know, throughout time and, and space, uh, really they have all had some, some value placed on interrelationship between um, species, our, our relationship with nature. And so I think that that's another piece too to consider. And then as you build these kind of spaces, they become spaces that are wonderful spaces for various spiritual practices. So I think there's some arguments there. And then finally, um, this idea of aesthetics and sense of place. So it goes back to what I was talking about, about Arizona and tourism. Well, you know, a lot of us, we lament, you know, when we go to different places in our country and we say, oh, it all looks the same. There's all these same big box stores and the same restaurants. And so everything's starting to look the same. The houses all look the same. But what gives us our sense of place is the Sonoran Desert. And so I think, you know, that idea of helping to preserve that, that sense of place, you know, by, by having, um, when people move to the valley, they see more and more native plants. It, it gives more of a sense of place than, you know, a lot of non-native plants. And again, these native uh, gardens are beautiful. I mean, that's a picture there of a native hibiscus and it's a beautiful plant. It's, you know, diminutive, you know, and the flowers, you have to really look at them close up to enjoy them, but there's so much aesthetic value and beauty, I think in the Sonoran Desert. So just wanted to give a little bit more um, background on that. And then now we're gonna look at uh, pollinators because I've been talking about, you know, we're developing, talking about developing pollinator habitat. So why are pollinators important? So many, many plants that are grown around the world rely on pollinators that transfer pollen between plants for uh, the sexual reproduction of plants. So we count on these pollinators to produce a lot of our foods, beverages, and medicines and other human purposes. So that's a big reason that we want to conserve our pollinators. And then also because pollinators are important parts of food webs throughout the world. So um, those I think are two, two of the main reasons that we want to conserve our pollinators and have habitat that supports them. So just want to touch on this. This could be a whole entire presentation in and of itself about pollinators of our region. Um, just to get into just a little bit about what some of the different organisms would be that you'd be supporting in your yard if you're building these kind of habitats. So our native bees are our primary pollinators. This is not honeybees. Those are European. Um, they were brought over here originally and um, they've naturalized. But our native bees are typically solitary bees. Many of them are ground nesting um, and they are, uh, they're much smaller. They don't, they don't look like, many of them don't look like typical bees. The Sonoran bumblebee is one that looks more like your typical bumblebee, the iconic uh, bumblebee. But a lot of our native bees don't even look like bees and they're very, they're hard to see, um, but they're active. And what they do is they gather pollen for their own nests. And so they're actually actively, whereas some of our other um, pollinators are sort of accidentally <laughs> gathering pollen, our native bees are actually seeking it out for their nests. And so as they move from flower to flower, they're gathering pollen and they're allowing those plants to get pollinated and be able to reproduce. And then there's this idea of flower constancy. Native bees will kind of stick with the same species um, as they uh, spend their day moving through and gathering pollen. So they're, uh, it's more efficient because they're not going to other species at the same time. And then that's not helping with pollination because it's different species. And then they're also known to forage longer and in more inclement weather than honeybees. So they'll be out there, um, they're real powerhouses. So they are our primary pollinators. Um, we also have, surprisingly, and I didn't know a lot about this until I got into 
uh, reading about it, but beetles, flies, and wasps are also pollinators here in the Sonoran Desert. Not as large of, of impact as the native bees, but they are pollinators. And then of course, the much loved butterflies and the lesser known and maybe appreciated moths are pollinators as well. And then hummingbirds and some types of bats. So these are the types of animals that you'd be supporting um, in your environment. And what's really good about building pollinator habitat is if you build pollinator habitat, it supports all other wildlife. And specifically, if you focus on native bees, you're, you're really, what you do for native bees is good for all other wildlife, essentially. And we'll be talking about that as we get into these uh, guidelines. So now I'm gonna kind of get into the actual pollinator pathway. And there's, um, there's three different levels that you can participate at. There's an entry level. That's what I'm gonna spend the most time on today because I don't know where people are coming from as far as their experience, but there's other levels as well. And so the entry level is really um, targeted to people that might be new to Arizona and the Southwest and gardening in the desert or new to gardening at all or, or new to pollinator gardening or have a small space or limited time and resources because it doesn't require a whole lot to get started on the entry level. There's two other levels, corn comprehensive that add a whole bunch of other practices and more plants into the mix. So those, um, those are a little bit more demanding and you can start at the, the kind of the contributing level and work your way up or just stay at the contributing level. And that's a link to the website. So what I'm gonna do now is go through the about seven or eight different specific guidelines that you would need to complete in order to certify your habitat. Even if you chose not to certify your habitat, I think these are all pretty good um, practices. So we'll talk about those. These were developed by a panel. I recruited folks from around the valley that were experts in different aspects of um, pollinator biology or native plants. And they worked on these guidelines for, it took us about a month or two to go through and kind of develop these as a group. So um, it, they do have some authority and I will have the list of uh, the folks that helped me develop these at the end. So we'll be talking about them. They're roughly in three different categories. If you see on the left-hand side under component, the physical components, so the abiotic things, the cultural practices, what you actually do as the gardener, and then the plantings, what type of plantings do you have? So those are the three main things. I'm gonna go down one slide per, uh, guideline and talk about those. So I realized I didn't stop for questions. Um, I'm going to kind of, if people have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. I'm going to work through the guidelines and then we'll stop and, and talk a bit. But yeah, uh, we don't have any questions. Okay. Yet. Okay, great. But feel free to put any in because I kind of got really in the moment and I forgot to mention that. So, so let's talk about guideline one. This has to do with sunlight. So because most of our pollinators like open areas and sunny areas and most of our native plants, no surprise, are adapted to either full or part sun, four to six hours of sunlight per day. So you don't want, and this, I think a lot of people would be hard pressed not to meet this guideline, you know, because it's hard to have, it, have a habitat that's not getting that kind of sun. Um, but that basically is, you know, kind of a, a consideration. A um, couple other things about if you're going to garden in containers, it's probably better to situate them, especially in the summer, where they're going to get morning sun and afternoon shade because the, the sun is so harsh here in the summer. Um, and be prepared for a lot of watering because um, plants, I think they dry out more in the containers. I have more trouble with containers than I do in the ground. If you're going to plant in the ground, we're just moving out of that best window. September and October is ideal, but I've put things in um, all the way through in, you know, in the wintertime as well. Um, it's just the, the longer you wait, the closer the summer is getting and let the less time the plants have to adjust, you know, to getting established before the summertime. And the warmth of the soil is still in play right now, which would we'll be losing. So that's our first guideline. Um, the second guideline really has to do with our native bees. So it has to do with not disturbing your soil um, unless you're planting, because many of our native bees are ground nesters, so you don't want to disturb their habitat. Um, also, the more you disturb your soil, the more invasives you're going to get. And I've seen this is really obvious when I've seen people disturb soil, how they really battle with invasives. So those are some of the reasons that you wouldn't want to disturb the soil. Also, there's really no reason to be adding lots of amendments where you'd be disturbing the soil. 
So that's a guideline that I think is um, pretty easy to implement. The third one is probably the biggest ask in the pollinator pathway and the, and the panel, we spent a lot of time on this and talking about this and we decided to go all in and say, you know what, if you are wanting to do a pollinator garden, not to use any pesticides in your garden. And so, and that means insecticides, herbicides or fungicides in, in, the, in the garden space with a couple of exceptions. And so I think we kind of landed on it. Actually, Pam, I think, was somebody that really kind of said, you know, if we're going to ask people to do pollinator gardening, this is really, we really have to ask them to do this piece. I really thank her for having the force to, you know, to kind of stand her ground on that because we were vacillating back and forth on this a bit. But, you know, really the idea is, is these, these chemicals are harmful. They harm our insects, which most of our pollinators are insects. So we have that piece. There's also a growing body of evidence that even herbicides and fungicides are harmful to pollinators. And um, we're just adding more and more into the soil, you know, more and more contaminants into the soil. We do have a couple of exceptions. Um, so borate active ingredients, this would be like for dealing with the red ants or soapy water, um, except for not putting those on larval, larval host plants, which we'll talk about. Um, and the other thing is, it's okay if you want to, if you need to spray maybe out around the foundation of your home, but not to spray into your garden. And ideally, it would be good if, you know, that was limited and if that was done at times when pollinators aren't active. Um, and there's a whole lot we can talk about around surrounding that. But it's really about not spraying into the garden. You know, I was surprised. I had a pest control company that used to come to spray for scorpions and things like that. And I thought they were just spraying around the foundation of the home, but they were spraying all into my plants. And so I stopped using them because I realized what was happening in it. There was no, no reason to be having them spray out into the garden for, for that. I just needed the, the foundation treated. So that's sort of what the ask there. Um, also, you have to think about, well, where are my plants coming and could they be already have been treated? So there's a couple things you can do. You can ask at the nursery if the plants are USDA certified organic or the seeds. A lot of times they'll say they don't know. They'll say, we don't know. These plants come from somewhere else. We don't, we don't know anything about them. And so you might want to think about shopping elsewhere. Um, you can grow your plants from seed. The Maricopa Native Seed Library has uh, seeds. They are, have not been coated with pesticides. A lot of seeds that you buy from commercial seed companies can be coated with pesticides. And then the entire plant that grows from that seed, leaves, you know, fruits, everything is contaminated with pesticides. So this one is probably the biggest ask um, as far as, um, you know, asking people not, not to use any pesticides of any type. And there's some more information on the website about this. So another guideline, be accepting of plant damage that's going to be caused by the target pollinators, because this is the whole point of putting some of these plants in. So butterflies and moths, they lay their eggs on certain plants that we call their host plants. Now, for some butterflies and moths, it's a very specific plant or like genera of plants. And then in other, uh, with others, it's more, they have a little bit more cosmopolitan. They're not as picky but um, there's usually just a, a range of plants. So for um, each particular butterfly or moth species, you can usually look up, you know, what plants are their host plants? And I have a chart um, on the plant list that goes through for all the ones um, that I was able to find information for what their host plants are. So basically what you're doing here is you're allowing these butterflies and moths to reproduce in your yard because if they can't lay their eggs, then they all they can do in your yard then is obtain some nectar or pollen and move on. They can't um, they can't reproduce there. So this is a really important piece. And so because of the fact that the plants, uh, excuse me, the um, the larvae, which like here's an example of a monarch caterpillar on the slide, they're going to eat down the plant in order to continue to grow, um, go through. Uh, Get, gather enough energy to go through metamorphosis and become a butterfly or moth. So the damage is just, you know, it's, it's part and parcel of it. And so, you know, for some gardeners that could be really revolutionary, you know, and oh, wow, like I'm actually wanting damage, you know, but the idea is, is that the plants are functional, you know, that, that the host plants are, are functional. Some of them are beautiful too, but we want the damage. If we have damage, then we know it's working, you know? And so some people may say, oh, I took, there was too much damage or really ate my plants down. It's like, well, you can, 
add more next year then if you feel like you got if you got hit pretty hard you had a successful garden and keep adding more you know so that's that guideline now the fifth guideline has to do with invasive species it's important to get these things out of every way we can um the three that are the most um kind of concerning in the sonoran desert right now are stink net buffalo grass and fountain grass the Arizona Native Plant Society has some really good information on the invasives, how to identify them, how to take them out. Um, I do mostly hand pulling. Luckily, stink net is, I'm not dealing with the grasses. They're harder to pull out, um, but stink net, they are challenging. We can talk more about that. There's a lot of information, much more information on the Plant Society website than I have time for today. But basically what these invasive species are doing, two problems is they outcompete a lot of our natives. And then they're also, um, they burn hot, they constitute a big fire danger. And a lot of these plants have been responsible or at least contributing to the fires that we've been experiencing. So it's really important to identify them and get them out everywhere we can. So the sixth one is probably the one that is most exciting to people because it has to do with the flowering plants. And so the idea here is that we want to have pollen or nectar um, that's, um, we want to have a constant source of pollen or nectar. So we want to have a constant source of blooming plants that provide pollen or nectar. And I said in the immediate surroundings, because if you're, you can also look around if you, um, let's say if you're in an apartment complex, you don't have to only just count, let's say the plants on your balcony, but what's in your immediate surroundings. And so we have a plant list of nectar plants that also shows like their breakdown of their expected seasons that they bloom. So you can kind of look at that and kind of gauge and say, you know, okay, I need to have blooms for each of our four seasons. What plants will cover that? And you can actually, with only a handful of plants, three or five plants, you can get a year round bloom. Um, because some of them are just very, they're blooming many, many months a year. And some of these are, uh, yeah, some of these are kind of long blooming. Also just the chuparosa comes to mind and creosote, but there's many, many of them that, that you can choose from. So that's sort of, I think that's actually the last guideline. Um, let me go ahead and go to my, oh, no, I almost forgot about the specific, the specificity about the specificity about the larval host plants. And that is because of the situation with monarchs and their decline, uh, we decided to put in that everyone in the pathway should have the desert or rush milkweed, which is our native um, milkweed to our area that the monarchs and the queens will use to lay their eggs. And um, so that is actually a guideline as well. So that's the only plant that's actually required specifically in the, um, in the, whole, uh, the whole habitat guidelines is to have this particular plant. So now I've covered a lot of ground and I apologize for not stopping sooner, but here in this slide, I'm just reviewing kind of the, um, the habitat guidelines I went over. Um, those are the levels for contributing. That's what it would take to create a habitat that would be certified by the pollinator pathway um, and be added to the map. There's, like I said, there's two other levels that ask for uh, other practices as well. But at this point, I'm going to kind of stop for questions. I think that that's kind of, that's the bulk of the presentation. I think I have some miscellaneous things that come after this, but I'll go ahead and um, stop and see where the questions are. Okay, great. Yes, we have had a few come in. Um, one question um, was uh, if, number one, if there's a way to get a copy of the slides or if this information mm -hmm. is posted somewhere else. So I just want to remind the audience that we will, we will post this recording to the Native Plant Society's YouTube channel. So that is one way to see it. Not that you, I want to make some people force them to watch a video again to see the slides, but I did put a comment in there about the Native um, the native Seed Library's website where the guidelines are, but um, do, do you think that these slides would be posted to the Native Seed Library site or would you like us to post them somewhere um, via the Native Plant Society so they can be accessed? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I should probably put I'll put the slides up as well, maybe as a separate um, in the, probably in the, um, there's a section on education. Um, so yes, I will post them. If people want to know, whatever's the best way to get that link out, just let me know, Lisa. Okay, so the Maricopa Native Seed Library website? 
they, that's yeah. where eventually people can look. Okay, great. Yes, yes. All right. And then uh, we did have some comments. Um, I'll wait on those. Um, there was another, at least one more question. Um, yes. So you mentioned, you know, like that milkweed is a must have plants. And then there's mm -hmm. obviously lots of recommend, recommended plants. So a uh, question is, is, are there any plants in the garden that are deal breakers? So basically mm -hmm. plants you definitely should not have. The invasive plants. Obviously, besides the three invasives. Yeah, <laughs> the invasives. So the way that when if you go to look at the form, there's a Google form that you fill out for the habitat um, guidelines, and it's based on that plant list that I had linked back a couple of slides back. Um, the plant list is pretty extensive. It, my goal was, and I think I left this out earlier, is that this is a habitat program that really emphasizes native plants. Um, because I think it's important for the, all the reasons I outlined, but it doesn't exclude non-natives. And so non-natives are, can be additionally in your yard, but they, um, and in some cases they count, you'll have to just see how the, how the, it's hard to describe it, but I have um, kind of like when you go through and you say what nectar plants you have, you have to have ones for each of the seasons. And then there's a where, where you can add an other in. So I'm not excluding non-natives, but I'm trying to emphasize and steer people toward the natives. But you can have non-natives. But my preference would be if you have non-natives, uh, no, don't take them out, but start adding and adding, adding as many natives as you can handle in your yard, you know, as you go through in time, you know, with time, just because of the value of them. Um, but not for people to start wholesale, you know, removing everything that they have either. A lot of people have a lot of non-natives, um, you know, and that's just the reality of it. I've, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of people's yards because I was doing some consultations and um, we have a lot of non-natives out there, but some of them are better than others. And if you add the natives in, I think that's, that's really where you, where you want to go with that. Great, thank you. And um, so there is another question about the milkweeds. Um, do other Arizona native milkweed species like Asclepias and Gustafolia replace the requirement for Asclepias subulata, or um, or they're just awesome to have? And I, I remember this is a topic that we did discuss a lot in the in the subject matter expert committee, and I yep. have specific thoughts on this. So I'd love to hear your your answer to this. Yeah, I think what we landed on is the other species are in addition to subulata because of the difficulty with like Angustifolia, the, the um, what is it, Arizona milkweed, um, harder to keep alive because it's a little more picky. It needs more shade. It needs more water. And we thought, I'm specifically tailoring a lot of this to, you know, people that aren't in the Native Plant Society, because if only people in the Native Plant Society are doing this, we're in trouble. We need to get as many people as we can involved in this. And so having people put in subulatas is going to be a lot easier than asking non -gar you know, people that aren't gardeners and don't know a lot about Native plants to, to deal with ones that are pickier. So the other milkweeds are in addition to, but they don't substitute for subulata because we thought that was the one that was really the most critical. Um, to have. Okay, great. And, um, and then there was a comment, um, but there is a question in there too, um, which I'll address now. We can um, maybe get to the comment um, after you're done with your presentation. Um, we just move to open Q&A. Um, so where can people get the seeds from the Maricopa Native Seed Library? I'm not sure if you mentioned the locations, but if you had, um, if you can Again, um, say the, the college's um, specific locations where people can, can access those. Yep, I think there's a slide coming up. I don't remember if it's the very next slide or not, but I, can, I will definitely talk about that in just a few minutes. Okay, great. And that is yeah. um, all for the questions right now. We have some comments, which I'll, I'll go back to later. But yeah, you can keep going. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember what the next slide is, so we'll see. Um, oh. My screen froze here. Ooh. Oh, good. Um, this is my chance to thank all, and give credit to all the people that participated in the subject panel, the experts, um, including Pam McMilly, who I mentioned. Um, this group really, I think, spent a lot of time really, you know, trying, and we met in smaller groups and had a lot of discussions by email as well. I think the group really, um, 
really had a lot of things to hash out that were that were challenging. So I really appreciate that group for doing that. Um, this is just a recap, again, I guess, of what the pollinator pathway is. That's a little screenshot of where gardens are that people have signed up already. I think about 40 people have signed up. I haven't done a lot of promotion yet uh, for this. I've still been gearing kind of up for that. But we are, you can kind of see there's a lot of people kind of in the Phoenix and Scottsdale area and a little bit on the margins. We'd love to keep filling in the map. And it's not just limited to Maricopa County. I probably shouldn't have named it Maricopa Pollinator Pathway in hindsight. I should have thought about that a little more because it's not only for Maricopa County. It's meant to be for adjacent counties as well. I didn't really think that through, I don't think very well. Um, but I just wanna give you some encouragement that they do come. If you build it, they come. Um, maybe not right away, but they do. I started with a bare dirt, weedy garden in 2011, and um, each year it kept adding and adding, and I had so many different species coming to that space. It was amazing. It blew my mind in a lot of ways how it went from one extreme to another, but even on a small scale, it doesn't have to be what I did here. It could be much smaller scale and still have an impact. Um, here's the slide about the seed library. So the seed library, um, I work at the Maricopa Community Colleges and we currently have a location at the libraries at the Phoenix. Um, so th don't get confused with the public libraries. This is the community college libraries. I've had some folks um, get confused with the public libraries. We're at the Phoenix Community College Library, Gateway Community College Library, Glendale Community College Library, Rio Salado and Scottsdale Community College Libraries. Um, those are kind of on the website you can there's links to each of those and then you can actually rio salado is not quite open yet i probably shouldn't really be advertising that yet it's coming soon so i probably should change that to coming soon but uh very soon and um anybody can use the c library you don't have to be affiliated with the colleges just come in you have to just check their hours come in and it's all on the honor system so you don't have to have a library card you don't have to Fill anything out, everything's anonymous, and we just ask people not to take more than three packets a month a person. And it does focus on Maricopa native plants, and a lot of them are wild collected. I've been collecting in the Tonto, and some of them are collected um, on the campus gardens. And then just some references. This might actually be, wow, that's okay. I'm sorry, I went full bore and didn't stop for questions earlier. So that's the end of the official presentation. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, so I do still invite people to put questions in the chat, but I am going to stop the recording now um, and then we'll move, move on to just an open discussion.